The following program is a production of WMFE, Orlando, Melbourne, Daytona Beach. Coming up on The Arts Connection. A powerhouse of women making a difference in the arts in Central Florida, including one who supports all of the arts. Also, we visit with an artist who takes her art-loving message to the streets. The arts are alive and well, as you know, yes. and I love you very much. And a petite fashionista who is a mega supporter of the arts. All that and more on The Arts Connection. The Arts Connection is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to WMFE from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Arts Connection, your source for all things creative here in Central Florida. I'm Cecily Wilson and we're joining you from Janine Taylor Folk Art in downtown Sanford. The gallery combines folk art with studio artists who make up Gallery on First, an incubator of sorts for emerging artists, all under the watchful eye of Janine Taylor. And we're going to visit with her a little later on and learn more about the gallery in just a moment. But first, there's one name synonymous with the arts in Central Florida, Margot Knight. She's the woman at the helm of an organization that's brought more attention to the arts world. And I had a chance to sit down with her to find out how she does it. Mention the name Margot Knight, and this is typically the response she'll get. Champion for the arts. Easy. She is what helps keep us going here in Orlando. Champion for the arts indeed. Jean Columbus, executive director of the Orlando Repertory Theater, says Margot Knight is a one-woman powerhouse in Central Florida's art world. I don't know that our, our Central Florida uh, community truly understands the impact that this one, per one person can change a community and, and Margot Knight. Margot Knight has changed this community. She represents all the arts in Central Florida and, and all the mediums equally, so be it theater, dance, visual art, music, she speaks about all of them with passion and she speaks about all of them with great knowledge. We caught up with Margot on the set of her monthly Orange TV talk show called Participate at the Cultural Advantage for a little one-on-one -on -one airtime. But it's another role that really keeps Knight busy. Now, if you didn't know, she is the mover and shaker behind an organization called United Arts of Central Florida. It raises money for arts groups across the region. And since it started in 1989, it's handed out over $90 million. I'm just trying to keep it going. I mean, it was created um, by a very forward-thinking group of corporations about almost 20 years ago. We'll be celebrating 20 years next, next year. And Mayor Bill Frederick, former mayor of the city of Orlando, who really looked around the country and said, what can we do to stabilize the cultural community because we want Orlando to be an international city. Many say Knight has taken United Arts to a whole new level since joining the group as its executive director in 2001. That consistency of her in that position and those of us in administrative positions that have been here for a while has really helped us start to identify who we are and what we do. She's brought an understanding of the true value of the arts to the community, so it's not just that good feeling you get when you go out to see a performance and you enjoy it, but she's brought that business sense to it. Knight has increased funding for the United Arts Individual Artist Program by creating a way to give more money to more artists like Orlando's Brian Feldman. Brian Feldman, uh, the performance artist here in town who did the, leaper, the leaping thing on Leap Day, people like him, he's going to do a whole grant uh, where he's He's going to have a 24-hour phone booth marathon. And Orlando sculptor Mindy Colton. She does all of her work in aluminum now, and a small grant from us helped her learn how to work better in bronze so those magnificent horses that she creates can now be done in a different medium. Knight has also helped create the Red Chair Project, an online one-stop shop to finding out about everything cultural going on in Central Florida. It's a collaborative marketing effort that benefits everyone in the artistic community. People all working together and having a result that no individual organization could ever hope to achieve in terms of driving uh, what we call butts and seats. I'm going to be going on the road shows with the Convention and Visitors Bureau to meeting planners in New York and in Chicago and D.C. to say when you come to Orlando, 
the new branding is where creative minds gather. Here are some of the things that your folks can do. And now Knight's own creative mind is set on a new multi-million dollar project for Orlando, the Downtown Performing Arts Center due to open in 2012. And United Arts has a vested interest in making sure all the seats are filled. Our community is going to be asked to step up philanthropically in a way they never have because we've created a new cultural institution in the Performing Arts Center that's twice as big as any other cultural institution in the region. Her desire is to create a broad cultural base so the Central Florida community can express itself. Government and individuals and foundations and uh, corporations all work together in a very cost-effective way to provide support uh, for the arts, to create a sense of place. Here's who we are and here's what we want to say about ourselves through song, through dance, through visual art. But there's no less love for traditional organizations like Orlando's Ballet, Opera, and Philharmonic. Because they're the cornerstone. The opera and the ballet are absolutely dependent on the health of the Philharmonic. They all, their fates are all entangled. It must have been fate that led Margot to the arts. I started out in life wanting to be a high school history teacher, and I forgot to learn how to coach football. So when I didn't get a teaching job, teaching history, I fell back on my acting. I did the New York thing, I was in outdoor drama, but I literally hated waiting for other people to give me work. So I was able over time to combine my love for history and art. Her love for the arts is clear. She even turned her birthday party into a wedding of the century, marrying the business community with the arts community, raising thousands of dollars for the arts. And if she's not hosting an event, she's attending one. I have to admit that I absolutely will always love theater. Um, and I try to see, but I try to go to every group that we fund at least once every two years. And the big folks I try to go to, I counted it up once and it was kind of frightening how many nights I'm out just experiencing the product. Because how can I do my job if I don't see the work? And at the end of the day, when the camera stopped rolling and her work is done, Margot wants her reputation to speak for itself. I want to be somebody who makes a difference and makes the arts stronger. For more information on United Arts and its upcoming fundraising events or the Red Chair Project, simply log on to the links at our website. Well, here's another one woman ambassador for the arts in Central Florida. Donna Dowless has tirelessly promoted the arts and in her own unique way. When Donna Dowless puts brush to canvas, what you get is nothing short of love. My artwork portrays the feeling of love and giving and receiving love and one person to another. Donna is a self-taught, award-winning artist whose work is not only about love, it's about passion. My work over the last 15 years being a showing and exhibiting fine artists is really making a statement about people and their lives and about loving what you do and loving who you are. She knows what it feels like to follow your heart. For years, she worked in the entertainment industry, promoting the work of other artists, until a chance meeting with Andy Warhol changed her focus. He encouraged her by saying, if you're an artist in your heart, so be it. Donna is now living her dream through her art. Art builds sustainable community. Art builds interest. Donna's paintings are on display in galleries throughout Florida, like here at the Grand Bohemian Gallery. Each piece is distinctly recognizable, signed, sealed, and delivered with her signature heart. It's all about love for me, and uh, I am known as the heart artist. Now she has a new title to add to her credentials. I'm the ambassador of love for the city of Orlando. Yes, she said ambassador of love. Recently, Mayor Buddy Dyer appointed Dallas to this official position because of her civic involvement and dedication to the arts. Dallas has done everything from serving on the board of the downtown arts district to giving art classes at the Coalition for the Homeless. And I can think of no one that more epitomizes good feeling and good good attitude for the city of Orlando and its people. So she's a great representative of downtown, the arts community, and uh, the type of spirit that we ought to have in the city of Orlando. It's a city with heart, and we are a city with heart. So when I was officially named the ambassador of love and took this responsibility on, I'm honored to do it and continue to spread and share that. No doubt you're wondering, what does an ambassador of love do? 
be the arts are alive and well, as you know. Yes. Donna will be out well. spreading love, spreading the message of fellowship and interacting with people, whether they're visitors or residents, and uh, just connecting with people. Connecting and spreading the love one heart at a time, using her art to get the job done, and of course, random acts of kindness go a long way. I'm going to give you the blessing of love. I have uh, glass hearts, uh, or the tokens of hearts. I've had different versions of them through the years, and through a random act of kindness, I will walk up to someone, I will present them with a blessing of the heart and just remind them how wonderful it is to be here in Orlando and how important love is to ourselves, to each other. May the power of the heart be with you. Everyone knows something about love. So that little blessing or that visual of the art, it evokes emotion. So if there's ever any question of what love is, when you've been with someone for many years and you can sit in silence and know that everything is going to be okay. When you're surrounded by your family and everything and how warm it feels inside. It is pure unpredictability. If you want the proper definition, perhaps you should ask the ambassador of love. Love is kindness and goodness and honor. Love is everything. You can see Donna's work on display at the City Arts Factory in downtown Orlando. If you'd like more information, simply log on to our website. Well, if you're just joining us, we're here at Janine Taylor Folk Art in downtown Sanford. And Janine has been a supporter of the arts for more than 10 years. And she's joining us again. Janine, thanks for having us. We've been Thank here before. You. Yes, you have. But this time we want to talk to you about something a little differently. You've been a folk art uh, expert, if you will, for more than 10 years. And you actually fell in love with folk art by traveling to another job. Then you've dedicated your gallery with this type of art. How has this been rewarding for you? Well, it's been rewarding because I like to be able to bring something different to Central Florida. There are several folk art galleries and museums all across the United States and um, the world, but I just felt like this was something that would make us special, make us a little bit different, and so that I, although it's a niche market, um, I really enjoy being different. Absolutely. Well. What's different about our program this time around is that we are focusing on women making a difference in the arts and your gallery here, Gallery on First, is kind of an incubator of sorts for emerging artists and, and talent and this is an opportunity for them to kind of show their, their work. Yes, and we've, uh, we also want it to be something that we can foster creativity, whether it be, as you said, an emerging artist or an established artist that just see needs to get their sales up. Um, for instance, this gallery here, the Rosie Marks Gallery, is available for artists to have shows in, um, to rent it for a month and be able to show their art. We've had several groups of women come in and do that. And so um, we just want to be able to, you know, help the process along as much as we can. Now, as someone who has watched the arts grow in the uh, Central Florida area for the past 10 years, what observations have you made about women in the arts? Well, I think that women realize that the arts are not a choice, that they are an integral part to a community and um, just give us a sense of place. So um, women take it very seriously, especially women who go into the business of art. They know that this is something that is important and not just a choice. We want to know what do you see for the future of arts here in Central Florida? Well, I see the arts continuing to grow. Even in this economy, uh, the arts are here to stay. I think we've got some strong, strong entrepreneurs and some, the cities are behind us. And I just see the arts being an integral part of our community. All righty, well, you're making a difference here in your community and in the world of art among women. So thank you for sharing with us once again. You are welcome anytime. Thank you so very much. Now, if you'd like more information on Janine or the gallery, simply check out the links at our website. Well, there's certainly no doubt that women are doing amazing things in the world of art. And you may be surprised to know that the stories that come to life on stage are because of the written word of female playwrights. Well, you're about to learn more about an organization dedicated to the contributions of women playwrights. What do The Lion King, Vagina Monologues, Menopause the Musical, and Swimming After Dark all have in common? Swimming After Dark? 
Is this the original manuscript? They're all plays written and or directed by women. But they're the exception. Female playwrights and directors are far outnumbered by their male counterparts, says an Orlando expert. We as a theater community must be concerned about diversity and about inclusion. And without women, both of those are missing. It's this sense of gender inequity that prompted Orlando's Linda Michael, a playwright herself, to form WPI, Women Playwrights Initiative, in 2003. Its mission is to make sure the voices of women playwrights are heard on stage. Would you think I'm crazy if I told you that sometimes I think this house may be haunted? And so we started asking, can you remember the last play you saw written by a woman? Now when we started this in 2004, there was a high number, like 82% that could not. I'm pleased to say that because of our awareness, we like to think we brought some awareness to the table, um, that, that number has improved greatly. Michael says this season, Central Florida audiences will see more plays written by women than any season since WPI started. Swimming After Dark is the latest, soon to take the stage at Rollins College. I think a house remembers the patterns of life long after the people are gone. You have to tear it down to get rid of the stain. And, and it's being directed by, you guessed it, another Orlando woman, Jennifer Cavanaugh. And the glass is coming back, coming around, and then that'll take us right into the monologue. Does that work for you? It works for me. Excellent. As a director, I think you're, you're very much responsible for stage picture. You're responsible for what it is visually that the audience is experiencing. And that has to do with how the actors move. It has to do with the designs, the choices that the lighting designer makes. Swimming After Dark is billed as a bittersweet tale of love and literary intrigue. It was penned by a Virginia woman who won WPI's short play competition. Something is missing. Kavanaugh and Michael both say prompting the work of women playwrights is vital to the world of theater. Our voices, our stories are unique. Uh, well, truly, all people's stories are unique. But women tell stories differently. A, a story told from a woman's perspective is going to sound different, it's going to play differently on the stage, and it's going to have different memories. For many years, um, the stories of women and women's experiences have not been considered uh, important to everybody. The thought would be, well, it's a woman's play, maybe women will be interested, but uh, you know, who else is going to be interested? Well, we're all expected to be interested in Death of a Salesman. Um, we're all expected to be interested in, in much of the canon, which focuses on the story of men as action, as heroes. For actors like Courtney Barr, plays written by women provide a greater variety of roles for women. For me, when I go to audition for something, there's maybe two or three characters that I could possibly play. Whereas in a man's piece, a piece written by a man, there might be maybe one or two. But I think that women tend to take greater risks when they do get something produced. They do something new. They do something that really relates and really connects. And according to theater insiders, what really connects is a well-written, well-crafted script, one that's had its fair share of tabletop readings. Budding writers, take note. There could be a process of inviting your, your actor friends over and serving them some coffee and donuts or coffee and fruit and saying, I need to hear this play after you've got what you think is a good first draft. Then you could go public once you've made those revisions. By now you've climbed a ladder of, let's call it creative excellence, and you're getting the kind of feedback that you need in order to make the script better. That's the whole point, to make good scripts better. And to make the future better for women playwrights and directors. Of course, if you're interested in the Women Playwrights Initiative, then simply log on to our website. Well, before we go, there's one more woman that I want you to meet. She is an avid collector of all things fashionable, from pearls and Prada to furs and Fendi. Her name is synonymous with the arts, and she has a heart for giving back to the community as big as, well, her closet. <laughs> This is no ordinary closet. It's every woman's dream. This is it. <laughs> this is the closet. And it belongs to this woman, Harriet Lake, Orlando's own philanthropist and fashion diva. The reason that I built the house is because I couldn't find a black silk suit one day in my old house. 
and I decided I couldn't live like that anymore. So she solved that problem by putting in this custom designed conveyor belt inside her 38 foot by 18 foot closet. So I got space for short things and for full length gowns. Those are white blouses almost exclusively on the bottom. I'm not a material girl. <laughs> I just happen to have a lot of stuff. <laughs> and a lot of love for the arts. In fact, she's donated millions of dollars to the arts in Central Florida. She and her husband are no strangers to giving to organizations like the Orlando Ballet. We are so lucky to have this going on in this town, and it's, it's killing me, it's destroying me that all of those seats are not filled, especially for the ballet, which is the one, the one art form that I would never, I will never let them go down. Lake is just as passionate about charitable work as she is about what's in her closet. She proudly reveals that her philosophy is to give back to the community and make the world a better place. She remembers the words of renowned anthropologist Margaret Mead. She said it only takes one or two um, really dedicated, committed people to change the world. And that's how I feel about charity. You start somewhere, you either lead, you follow, or you get the hell out of the way, but you start with yourself and hope that others will follow. Aside from the arts, she says there is one health cause that's also close to her heart. I would like to see a cure for breast cancer. That is my true passion. Lake has funded two breast cancer boutiques at area hospitals, Orlando Regional Medical Center and Florida Hospital, to help women faced with this life-threatening disease. Well, I want a chain of boutiques where girls can go in. We're making it possible for them to think positively about it. We're going to have hats. They can go in there and get whatever they can use, and they, they need a lot. Each one of these boutiques is named, you guessed it, Harriet's. I never use my last name. I'm trying to keep a low profile here. Well, it might be kind of hard for Harriet Lake to keep a low profile. I mean, she has a style all her own. I don't know what style is. I only know it when I see it. My style is over the top, I admit it. In the spring of 2008, her over the top haute couture collection was featured in an exhibit at Orlando's Manello Museum of American Art. We caught up with Lake just before the opening. When we started thinking about who we could bring into our museum and have something totally different, realizing that Harriet is still with us and the retrospectives that we've seen in the past, such as Jacqueline Onassis and Grace Kelly and Princess Di, these ladies are no longer with us. Our goal was to give a reflection on who Harriet is and also to make a presentation in the museum that her clothes are actually a form of art and not just clothes. The truth is, who displays clothes until somebody's been dead 10 years or 15 in a museum? Nobody. They, they don't do it with live people. I never thought of it as art, but I guess it's called art to wear. If you consider this art, I mean, there, were some, there are some people that wouldn't be caught dead in this stuff. Well, not me. I couldn't pass up an opportunity to try on a few things. Are you too much or what? I look fabulous. <laughs> so, of course, I had to ask Harriet, of all the things she could collect, why clothes? That's simple. That's very simple. Like, I was brought up with two stunning drop-dead call out the cops, gorgeous girls, sisters. They were blue-eyed blondes. And I was this mousy brunette, little, and I was trying to distract from my face. And so I was quickly into clothing, which were outrageous and over the top. She collects shoes, hats, jewelry, and not just your everyday streetwear. I've got Shakespeare costumes, I've got Italian stuff, I've got Spanish dancing stuff, and uh, it's like a costume department. Harriet even collects things she doesn't even wear. That's in case, just in case I need a pocketbook. And then of course I fell in love with these uh, flowers, and then I've got my Fendi's, 
These are Fendi's. Everybody loves Fendi's. They don't do a thing for me, but they are collectible. And God knows I am a collector. A collector who loves the arts, the art of giving, and who believes you can never have too much. My theory is too much is not enough. So there. <laughs> And that's the way I dress, and that's the way my house is. So when will enough be enough? When the last check bounces, <laughs> count me out. <laughs> well, one thing you can say about Harriet Lake, she knows what she likes, and she knows how to get things done. Well, that wraps it for us here at the Janine Taylor Folk Art Gallery in Sanford. We certainly hope you have enjoyed our program. Don't forget to listen out for us on the radio, 90.7 FM. That's the Arts Connection Minute, weekday mornings at 9.59, starting June 30th. And don't forget to check us out on the web. You'll find our podcast there, as well as information for the stories you've just seen. You'll also find links to the Red Chair Project and its calendar of upcoming events. And, of course, you can send us your ideas there at wmfe.org arts. Again, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.